tonight, the heads of Canada's biggest grocery store chains in the hot seat over soaring food costs and big profits. So a company needs some degree of profit. Record uh, you know, profits more than you've ever Mr. made, Singham. ever. What they're saying and what it means for your grocery bills. A debilitating and painful condition some say isn't taken seriously enough. It's like hot coals in your abdomen. Some prominent Canadian Olympians are speaking out. That's not what the Olympics stand for. It's no. absurd and it's sad. How they're standing up to the Canadian Olympic Committee in our exclusive interview. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Canada's cost of living crisis is front and center tonight after lawmakers in Ottawa grilled the heads of Canada's big three supermarket chains over corporate profits at a time of widespread pain. $529 million, that's what Loblaw cleared in the fourth quarter of 2022 alone. For Empire, which runs Sobeys, it was $178 million. For Metro, $168 million. All those figures way up from pre-pandemic levels as many Canadians struggle just to put food on the table. Now, for their part, CEOs say those profits are not to blame for food inflation. But as Anise Hedari shows us, some lawmakers in Ottawa did not seem to buy it. As food prices keep soaring, politicians turn up the heat on Canada's top grocery executives. Grocery chain profits um, are not the reason for food inflation. And as I mentioned... Profit is too much profit. Well, so a company needs some degree of profit. Uh, Record you know, profits more than you've ever Mr. made. Singh, ever? I'm gonna, Mr. Singh, I'm going to stop you there. The heads of Loblaw, Empire and Metro asked point blank, are they making too much money? How much profit is too much profit? We're a big company and the numbers are very large. And executives say higher prices mean they bring in more cash, but not more profit. Our revenues have gone up, expenses have gone up. Margins have not gone up. They've been stable for a long time, and food margins have actually declined. So th those are facts. Then you go to packaging, tin up 53%, pulp up 45%. I'm not going to keep going on. Freight, fuel, labor, every Thank input at cost has gone up. The price sir. of business is going up. There have been increased profits at some grocery chains. Loblaw says it's from other parts of their business, and some experts back that up. We're buying different things, which may uh, affect profitability too. So might grocers do something to help out? Sure, they're not charities, but I'm not convinced that they're taking excessive price increases and fueling this. However, those price increases are substantial. Meat, up 7% since last year. Fresh vegetables, up more than 14%. Can I do this? Shoppers yeah, have noticed. This, but my bill just keeps going up. It doesn't matter how much I try to cut back. It's constantly going up, and I just don't even know what to do about it. There may not be much consumers can do right now. Experts say weather, labor shortages, and higher transportation costs continue to push up prices. All those problems outside the control of consumers or the companies. And Anise, it sounds like we're going to hear a lot more about what's driving this. That's right, Adrian. The House of Commons committee that held these hearings is still looking at food inflation. And there are calls for American chains like Costco or Walmart to testify. Eventually, the committee will put out a report. The Competition Bureau is also looking into this. Another report could come from that as well. That's months away. But the message from grocery stores is unlikely to change. Food prices are high. They're getting higher. And it's not their fault. All right. Anise Hedari, thank you. You're welcome. Well, food prices are still rising rapidly, there are signs that overall inflation is easing. Today, for the first time in more than a year, the Bank of Canada did not raise its overnight interest rate. For now, it's staying at 4.5%. This was expected as the bank hinted it would press pause on increases. But it says if the economic situation changes, it is prepared to raise rates again. Another big expense for Canadians during this tough financial time is access to the Internet. Tonight, this country's telecom regulator says it's trying to help with that. Aaron Collins breaks down the new plan. Take a stroll through any mall and it's easy to see. Demand for Internet access is a hot commodity these days. 
You can't do without the internet. You, you do just about everything on the internet. A big players control supply in Canada, making prices sky high. When you look at your internet bill and you compare it to everything else, it's pretty high. But Canadians shopping for access to the web could soon get a break. The CRTC is launching a review of how much big companies like Bell, Rogers and TELUS charge smaller companies to access their networks, imposing an immediate 10% reduction on some wholesale rates. We know that, that competition is good for Canadians uh, and what we're doing today is good for competition. For now, smaller internet companies will pay less to piggyback on the big three's networks and those savings could be passed on to consumers if providers choose to do so. Hang on tight, don't lock into any long-term contracts. Uh, I, think, I think there is uh, uh, definitely a ray of light here that's coming. Welcome relief for Canadians used to paying more than most to get online. Industry watchers hope this is just the beginning and that more change could be coming from the country's telecom regulator. Hopefully we're seeing you know, a really big shift in how the CRTC evaluates what is fair and who they're prioritizing, and we're hoping that ultimately it's Canadians. Ottawa says reducing costs while increasing access to the web is a priority. You know, what we want is lower prices. The way that we have found in Canada to be able to do that is through competition. A tough objective with a decision on the merger between Rogers and Shaw looming. This new move will only impact the price of the internet at home or at work it won't bring down the cost of cell data. The CRTC says it's hoping to bring down those prices too. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. A CBC News exclusive tonight about Russian and Belarusian athletes and next summer's Olympics. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they were banned from international competition. But the IOC now says there may be a way for them to compete. Canadian Olympic officials seem to agree. Well, 40 prominent Canadian Olympians say no way. They are furious at the COC and they're speaking out only to us. There have been governing bodies that have stood up against the IOC and said, no, we don't want them to be here until you get out of Ukraine. All we're asking is for our country to do it. Is it hard to stand up to Russia? Is it hard to stand up to Thomas Bach and the IOC? Absolutely. However, you have to do it. You have to have moral courage and you have to do what's right. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're asking our governing body to do. Nobody likes when athletes go against, you know. The status quo. The status quo. So it's worth it for you. You got to do what's right. That's, that's real leadership. Rugby seven star Jen Kish. Track and fields Perdita Felicien and the gold medalist and former member of the IOC Becky Scott. Three women standing up on International Women's Day to try to force a change, to say, no, Russia has no place in the Olympics. Our full interview and their ideas for what needs to happen and the COC's response that's coming up in about 20 minutes. There is more pressure tonight on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to reveal what he knew when about China's attempts to interfere in Canadian elections. Here's Ashley Burke with what sparked the latest volley and just how harsh the rhetoric has become. The Prime Minister headed into question period for an increasingly brutal political fight. The Prime Minister is more interested in protecting himself than protecting the electoral system. It's almost as, as if he admires the basic Chinese communist dictatorship. The opposition pressing Justin Trudeau over his handling of election meddling attempts by Beijing. It is unfortunate and despicable that any member in this House uh, would question the loyalty to Canada of any other here, member here. in this House. No drama lesson will distract from the question that I asked. The question, the question was very clear. How much did the Liberal Party get in donations directed from Beijing? I've asked it multiple times. I find it incredible that he can't stand up and answer with a zero. This latest flare-up after Global News reported a high-level memo written for the Trudeau government warned Chinese officials had transferred money to a covert network aiming to interfere in the 2019 election. Whether federal candidates received money from China, uh, as I've stated many times, we have no information on that. Why does he continue to state the diametric opposite of the truth in his answers in this House of Commons. Did you compromise the election? The Prime Minister bombarded with questions 
refused to specifically answer what he knew and when. I know that no matter what I say, Canadians continue to have questions about what we did and what we didn't. And that is why an independent special rapporteur is going to be able to look at the entire landscape and dig deeply into everything anyone knew. But the NDP leader says that's not enough. Jagmeet Singh says that Canadians' trust and confidence in the electoral system is eroding and that the only way forward is a public inquiry. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. In the United States, Fox News host Tucker Carlson is facing some harsh criticism from some in the Republican Party. It comes after he tried to downplay the January 6th Capitol Hill riot. And as Paul Hunter shows us, court documents are revealing how Carlson may really feel about former President Donald Trump. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Maybe you've heard of Tucker Carlson, long seen as a proponent of the politics of former President Donald Trump. His program on Fox News is among the highest rated cable TV shows in America. Now, along with Fox News facing a mountain of criticism, in part from a lawsuit by the Canadian-American company Dominion Voting Systems. It's suing the network, claiming it knowingly aired falsehoods that in the 2020 election, its machines were rigged against Donald Trump. On what Carlson and others at Fox actually thought about Trump, new court documents with behind-the-scenes comments from that time. Texted Carlson, I hate him passionately. And with Joe Biden set to be sworn in, he texted, we are very, very close to being able to ignore Trump most nights. I can't wait. This, as criticism against Carlson grows on another matter, video he's now airing from the day of the January 6th riots, given to Carlson by the Republican Speaker of the House, narrated by Carlson this way. Protesters queue up in neat little lines. They give each other tours outside the speaker's office. They take cheerful selfies and they smile. As Carlson puts it, it was neither an insurrection nor deadly. In fact, as the world knows, that day left five people dead, more than a thousand people charged. For seeming to cherry pick video to now mislead Americans on that, Carlson was trashed by Democrats. Tucker Carlson is a propagandist publicly pretending to be a newsman. Tucker Carlson is a parasite on the body politic. And Republicans. I think it's bullshit. As for the latest Dominion court filing, says Fox News, it's misinformation and distortion. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Former Cabinet Minister Mark Garneau is resigning his seat in the House of Commons. Now it's time for me to go. It's been an honour serving my country alongside all of you. Thank you and farewell. Garneau has been an MP for the Liberals for the past 15 years, representing the Quebec riding of Notre Dame de Grasse Westmount. He served as Minister of Transport and then later as Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2021. Garneau, of course, made history in the 80s as an astronaut when he became the first Canadian in space. Now to an urgent call for better health care for Canadians with endometriosis. This is a disease which can cause debilitating pain. Experts say it's underdiagnosed and under-researched. Kate McKenna shows us one woman's journey. Maggie Archibald is about to have surgery that could change her life. I'm a little nervous and tired. I didn't sleep last night. She's headed to Atlantic Canada's only specialized endometriosis clinic, hoping a surgeon will remove the growths causing her intense pain. I think I'm ready to kind of have this next chapter happen. Archibald has endometriosis, a debilitating disease that affects 10% of women as well as some non-binary and trans people. Cells grow on the outside of a uterus causing painful lesions and cysts. A lot of people said it's like hot coals in your abdomen. Tracy Lindemann's new book examines endometriosis care in Canada. Patients often wait years for treatment, if they get it at all. Barriers exist all across Canada, but something that's really common uh, across the country, I would say, is impossibly long wait times. Archibald spent years in and out of doctor's offices not getting answers. So I got very frustrated with the lack of uh, response and, uh, and 
timeline. So I took it upon myself to write my MLA and explain my situation. A lot of people go to their family doctors or walk-in clinics if they don't have a family doctor, sometimes dozens of times, um, before anyone takes their concerns seriously and refers them on to a gynecologist. Archibald was referred here, but even with the referral, there's an 18-month wait list. I think the fact that we have any individuals who have to advocate for themselves to that extent is reflective of a problem um, in the system. Just a little update. Her surgery was a success. Things went really well today. I'm really pleased with um, how everything went. She's one step closer to being pain free, but she says she won't be completely relieved until everyone with endometriosis gets the care that they need. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Halifax. There's new concern tonight for Canada's boreal forest. CBC News has learned governments in this country have been vigorously lobbying to avoid international protections. As Jonathan Gatehouse explains, environmentalists say that puts the forest's future at risk. They point the finger at the Amazon. We're doing the same thing. Chief Keith Corston shows us these harvesting machines at work in the middle of a crown game preserve, just under an hour from his band office all above board and in accordance with Ontario's regulations. Alarmed by growing clear cuts and declining wildlife, the Chaplow Cree and two other Northern Ontario First Nations are suing the provincial government. It's like free rain. It's like the Wild West here again. When it comes to loss of pristine forest, Canada ranks among world leaders along with Russia and Brazil. Groups want to protect these trees and powerful Canadians are trying to stop that. Documents show fierce lobbying to change bills in New York, California, and the European Union that would have restricted sales of boreal forest products. Thank you, Senator Chu, for your leadership. In the Senator New York State Kavanaugh Senate, Jeremy Cooney was ultimately persuaded to take boreal forests out of the bill. How it stands out was the direct involvement from the Canadian government. And now this legislation excludes Canada or the boreal forest region in Canada. The boreal forest is under constant threat from industry. In the U.S., the Natural Resources Defense Council promotes environmental causes, and some of its reports on Canada's forest industry say Ottawa vastly understates carbon emissions from logging. Canada has been positioning itself as a, as a world leader on sustainability, and that's really... Uh, very much been a, a green veneer on top of what is really devastating practices. The Forest Products Association of Canada disputes the NRDC's numbers, and the lobby group calls bills targeting boreal products misguided because Canada already has rigorous regulations. Deforestation remains an issue in the tropics, says the group, not here. A point of view that Chief Corston says ignores the facts he sees on the ground. You're destroying a whole ecosystem. You're destroying it. Every day they're doing it, every, every hour of the day. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. Several prominent Olympians are standing up to the Canadian Olympic Committee. The greater risk to us is staying silent and complicit with this state. What they're demanding, but first. Iranian women are drawing inspiration in the face of intimidation. The revolution this time leading by the women. Why some say these protests are different. And history 30 years in the making. The moment this Canadian entered the record books. We're back to two. More angry protests in Greece today, just over a week after that country's worst ever rail disaster. Tens of thousands marched in the capital, Athens and other cities. They're demanding better rail safety after last Tuesday's head-on crash between a passenger train and a freight train. 57 people were killed in that collision. There were also protests in the country of Georgia, just south of Russia, over a new law that critics are calling authoritarian. It would label certain organizations and media groups as foreign agents if they get more than 20% of their funding from abroad. Some fear it would be used to crack down on dissent. 
On Tuesday, demonstrators clashed with police throwing stones and Molotov cocktails. <laughs> Protesters and police were also clashing on the streets in Sri Lanka today. For International Women's Day, hundreds came out to demand their government protect women's rights. Similar demonstrations took place in Israel, Indonesia, France and Spain, all demanding better pay, justice and safety. But we want to take you now to Iran, where, as Ithil Musa shows us, on this International Women's Day, the struggle for many is a matter of life and death. <laughs> on a day when women marched around the world <laughs> to mark International Women's Day. <laughs> In Iran, they are marching to protest the poisoning of schoolgirls. More than a 1,000 students have reportedly fallen ill over the past three months. The cause, still a mystery. Iran's supreme leader says the acts are unforgivable, but many inside and outside Iran blame the regime. It's like Taliban. Maybe they do this because they want their parents prohibited the girls going to school. Zarin Moyedin left Iran shortly after the revolution in 1979. Here is me. She says she was against it from the start. A large crowd of women. Exactly 44 years ago, Moyedin marched in Tehran alongside thousands of other women now we are for freedom. to demonstrate against a decree from the country's first supreme leader. We were protesting against the mandatory hijab. Moyadeen says her hope for change faded after years of repression. But the protests happening now sparked last year by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in police custody are restoring it. All the time brings tears to my eyes from the happiness that uh, uh, the revolution this time leading by the women. These two young Iranian-Canadian women closely watching the events in Iran unfold share that sense of hope as well, despite the dangers that women and girls continue to face. These uh, poisonings are another way that the government is trying to take revenge. I feel like it's not even a protest anymore, it's more like a revolution. A revolution, they say, for women, for life and for freedom. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. They have represented Canada at the highest level. Now a group of Olympians is calling out the IOC and the Canadian Olympic Committee. How do we avoid even having the conversation of Canada even boycotting? Their push for a stronger stance against Russia. A Ukrainian city once the scene of a massacre trying to put the pieces back together. I think it's not possible to forget, but everyone is trying. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. This man with the exhausted face and dangling cigarette is now dead. A captured Ukrainian soldier moments before he was allegedly killed by Russian troops. His last words on camera, Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine. Heroim Slava. Heroim Slava. In response, a video emerging today of Ukrainian athletes all answering him, if you will, with glory to the heroes. Heroim Slava. Heroim Slava. War has taken a lot. It's possibly taken their individual dreams. Ukraine suggesting it will likely boycott the Paris Olympics if Russian and Belarusian athletes are allowed to compete. Well, the IOC now says some Russian athletes could be able to compete. And the Canadian Olympic Committee has recently suggested it would agree to a neutral pathway for Russian athletes to go if details can be worked out. But not all Canadian athletes agree. At least 40 have signed a statement asking the COC to support an outright ban. Three of those prominent former athletes sat down exclusively with us to make the case for keeping Russia out. Is it not absurd that we have an aggressor at the Olympics, possibly, and the victim at home and giving up their dream? Is that not absurd, watching a bully win? Mm -hmm. That, to me, 
makes me not even want to watch the Olympics, I have to say, because that's not what the Olympics stand for. It's absurd and it's sad. To the 40 plus Canadian athletes who also signed the stern letter to the Canadian Olympic Committee, the likes of hockey star Haley Wickenheiser, soccer great Steph Labe, the prospect of Russian and Belarusian athletes competing in Paris is also an about face. Right after the invasion, athletes from those two nations were banned from international competition. Now the stance seems to be softening. The war is not. After this letter is delivered, what are you expecting to happen with the COC and what would you like to see happen? A retraction. Quite honestly, I, I, we're hoping for a retraction and that they pull back that position of support for Russia. It is support for Russia at a time when Russia is engaged in an unlawful, inhumane war and it's morally and you know ethically wrong. There have been you know, governing bodies that have stood up against the IOC and said, no, we don't want them to be here until you get, you, you get out of Ukraine. Uh, Sweden has done it, uh, Denmark, Norway. Why hasn't our country done that? All we're asking is for our country to do it. Is it hard to stand up to Russia? Is it hard to stand up to Thomas Bach and the IOC? Absolutely. You have to have moral courage and you have to do what's right. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're asking our governing body to do. Words have weight, especially when you consider the source. All these Olympians, Jen Kish, Becky Scott, Perdita Felicien are retired now, but their leaders, involvement in Canadian sports, still critical to their lives and professions, making saying this a bit of a risk. They insist they've had private conversations with the Canadian Olympic Committee and nothing's changed, so they're coming forward. I definitely probably won't ever get a job with the COC. <laughs> Like, they're not calling you. They're not calling they're not me not anytime calling soon. You. Anybody who, uh, sponsors who are associated with the COC may want to stay away from me. Nobody likes when athletes go against, you know. The status quo. The status quo. So it's worth it for you. You got to do what's right. That's, that's real leadership. We did weigh the risks and we did weigh the potential implications and consequences, you know, but the greater risk to us is staying silent and complicit with this statement because we disagree with it so strongly. So if there's someone at home who says, I hear you, the war is terrible, Russia invaded, this is awful, but an athlete is not Putin. An athlete is someone who's living a dream. Why ban the athletes? It is not easy, I think, for us to not think about the individual weight of this on a Russian athlete, a Belarusian athlete, who has nothing to do with the war, who opposes the war, and we know that they exist. But this is not about an individual dream. This is about basic human rights. It really is about being on the right side, I think, of history for a lot of us. And so um, when I think about what Ukrainian people are going through, and I think about an individual um, Russian or Belarusian athlete potentially not going to Paris 2024, to me, there's no comparison in what's at stake. That reference Perdita makes to Russian athletes who oppose the war is interesting. A few weeks ago, the CEO of the Canadian Olympic Committee told CBC in an interview that if there's some way of having exemptions for those athletes who can prove to us they're opposed to the war, we'd be willing to consider what the international community has in mind. But this may not be possible for Russian athletes when thousands in Russia have been detained for protesting the war. Some athletes boldly wear the letter Z on their uniforms, clear support of the war, and some are soldiers. And you know the IOC, you, you know how it works there. You have, you have been in those rooms. What are the conversations you think are happening right now? I mean, I think the IOC and Russia have some very deep ties. Russia is a very powerful, well-resourced nation with deep pockets and the capacity to host big events, major games, they are a very important partner to the IOC. I think that the, the reason and the rationale behind this then follows that they want to stay connected to their partners. Have you heard any conversations about a potential boycott? If the IOC is unwilling to budge and says, no, nope, they're, part, they're part of the Olympic Games. I think the only group or language around boycott that I've heard from is the actual um, National Olympic Committee of Ukraine, because fundamentally the idea of athletes from Ukraine um, sharing a pool or a track or a field with athletes from 
Russia is pretty morally reprehensible. If I was still playing, I would be okay sitting out of these games for the betterment of people and their lives. The, the, the Olympics are about unity and peace. To me, how do we avoid even having the conversation of Canada even boycotting? I know if I was an Olympian, it would be a hard thing. But why not go to each governing body and ask them to put pressure on the IOC? But if one begins, why can't the others? It could be a groundswell. And we're hoping it just begins a conversation. We heard back from the Canadian Olympic Committee tonight in a statement. It condemns the Russian invasion and values the opinions, it says, raised by these Canadian athletes. It also says it supports, quote, the continuation of the ban in the absence of clarity and concrete details on a workable neutrality model. For the full statement and more details, go to cbcnews.ca. Now, so many of Ukraine's cities have been scarred by the war, but the drive to rebuild is clear. That is why the Ukrainian army is doing its job, so that here in the rear, people can live as they did. The work being done to bring Bucha back from the brink. city of Bucha has been dealing with intense grief one year after the brutal occupation by Russian soldiers saw hundreds of civilians tortured and killed. Barbaric treatment that opened the eyes of the world. Margaret Evans was among the very first journalists to report firsthand on those atrocities. And tonight she shows us Bucha as it is now, a place of rebuilding and renewal. But it's an enormously difficult balance for the people to move forward with hope while still looking back in despair and a warning, the memories, the images are disturbing. There were many bodies, dead bodies. Do you know anything about the fight? Russian tanks and Russian armored vehicles. The place where they were destroyed by the Ukrainian armed forces. If I went, I found a body in the head of the head. He saw that uh, three of them was, uh, were shot exactly in this village. The remaking of Bucha underway. Foundations being poured to reshape not just the city, but all that its name has come to conjure. They've begun with Vokzalna Street, tanks long gone and 82 family homes being rebuilt. There is here a sense of haste. Dmitro Chechuk is the deputy mayor. You have to understand, he says, as a municipal government, we did not want to turn the city of Bucha into a city of grief. Since Russian troops pulled out of Bucha last April, Investigators have found or dug up the bodies of 458 civilians, including eight children. Victor, a resident of Oksalna Street then and now, witnessed some of the worst. He's not convinced now is the time to rebuild. Of course it will be beautiful, he says, but I think it's inappropriate right now. They could use the money to buy drones, for example, things for the army. But city planners clearly see efforts to encourage people back to their homes as part of the same battle being fought in the south and east of Ukraine, to stay on their own land. We would like to remove as much as possible everything that could remind people of the war, he says, also insisting that doesn't mean the dead will be forgotten. This is now Bucha's challenge, how to remember and how to forget at the same time. Probably they were uh, tortured. Yablunska Street, Bucha's ground zero. 
The men found here on this spot on April 3rd last year had been left lying in the open for a month. The eight men shot by Russian soldiers, an atrocity well documented by now. They died with hands bound and heads covered, and loved ones left behind are still struggling to restore the dignity their killers stripped from them in death. Sviatoslav Turovsky's father, Oleksandr, still hears his son's footsteps on the stairs. As it approaches six o'clock in the evening, I'm waiting for him to come in and say, hello, how are you? The wound will last a lifetime. Oleksandr's grief weighs on him. He has questions no one can answer. He worries his son and the others may have been betrayed by another man who played dead when they were all shot. It's not clear to me. They killed a lot of people on that street, peaceful people. And someone they shot, a witness, was left alive? There are no footsteps in the evening coming to ease his mind. Yablunska Street is next on the city's list for a makeover, but the ghosts that live here will not be easy to banish. Volodymyr Lizowski has returned from the front to his family home for a week's leave. People who return don't see clean, empty streets. They see neighbors who are shot, who are left lying here for a month. When they turn to the right, they see not a burnt house, but one where they drank tea or coffee more than once. Lizovsky was made to kneel beside the bodies of some of those neighbors when Russian soldiers knocked on the door, took him outside, beat him, and subjected him to two mock executions. When we first met him not long afterwards, he was still in hospital recovering. He joined the army as soon as he got out. There are certain rules of conventional warfare you can follow. Do this, don't do that, and you will live. In Bucha there was no such rule. You could just walk down the street and be shot. The link between what happened then and the fighting he's now a part of in the East is clear in his mind. That is why the Ukrainian army is doing its job, so that here in the rear people can live as they did But they are, he says, paying a terrible price. The losses of comrades on the battlefield joining his collection of ghosts. My name is Kirill and uh, it was very bad for us, but... We stay. The children of Bucha are now back at school, but at this lyceum, classes are barely underway when the air raid siren goes off. Part of daily life across Ukraine now. Here, it means 1,700 students heading for shelters in the basement a challenge for the teachers. Olha Zamana says the children have had different experiences. Some left and returned to houses more or less damaged, she says, and then there are families that don't even have a place to return to. And there are those, like Kirill, who lived through the occupation. Twelve when the Russians invaded Ukraine, he hid in the hallway when the shelling came close. A year later, he's still living with his grandmother and likes to escape into the fantasy world. It gives us a chance to go at virtual world and we are, cannot think about the real problems. Like when the war will end. The teachers say they don't raise, unless asked about, Bucha's darkest days, but they do try to build resilience. One of Kirill's classes, for example, is about stress. How to deal with the memories of what's happened here is another matter entirely. I think it's not possible to forget, but everyone is trying.
Margaret says that during her time in Bucha, she was told by the national police that across Ukraine, they've opened almost 65,000 criminal war crime cases against Russian soldiers, and 5,000 Ukrainians are still missing. Here's a change of pace. A movie that's helping change the landscape in Hollywood looks poised for some major recognition at the Oscars. Plus. I probably slept three, three hours, three hours and a half this weekend. Obviously an exhausting multi-day sled dog race. Meet the first ever female champion in our mall. We can now confirm that Prince Harry and Meghan's children will be using yes. their royal titles despite a major rift between the couple and the royal family. The two children will be known as Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet Diana. The princess's title made its debut today with the announcement of her christening. Under royal guidelines, the grandchildren of a monarch, in this case King Charles, are eligible for the titles. Ahead of this Sunday's Oscars, one movie has been racking up some major buzz from industry insiders and viewers alike. Eli Glasner now with a film that tackles family conflict and a whole lot more. And the actor goes to Michelle Yeoh. Even before the Oscars arrived, one film has been generating some of the season's most memorable moments. We want to be seen, we want to be heard. Thank you, thank you so much! Everything, everywhere, all at once is a mind-bending sci-fi adventure anchored around the relationships of a Chinese-American family that's already racked up major wins and is up for 11 Oscars. As a filmmaker, I was clenching my fist, being like, I wish I could have made this. Ethan Ng remembers his first impression. This director of an upcoming film about high school appreciated the depth. And I think the fact that they went individual, like not only, you know, for me being someone who's Chinese, but I think to anybody that's trying to figure out their own story, like I think that's a really inspiring thing. This isn't the first time the industry seemed to be on the cusp of change. And then it wasn't until Crazy Rich Asians came out that it just seemed to hit at a time that the world kind of seemed ready for it. What a beautiful family. A change driven in part by audience and industry embracing new perspectives, but also shifts within immigrant communities. Like a generation before us, they're now able to send their kids to school out in the suburbs and they're moving out to the suburbs. So the spread is also um, becoming past just the Chinatowns, the Koreatowns, the Japanese towns. When actor Hayden Sito arrived in Hollywood from Vancouver, there were so few opportunities, some said he should learn Kung Fu in Hong Kong. The whole point is to run against the wave. The whole point is to run against the wave. And, you know, I, I went into this blind. And like the multiverse in the movie, he sees many roads ahead. Well, now it's all lit up. You know, the path is right there. And I'm so excited for young Asian American actors and just, just to pursue it with like their full hearts and not be afraid. Inspired by a bold, brave blockbuster, unlocking worlds of possibilities. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. While we're talking about brave, have a look at these three brave women, also unlocking a world of possibilities at the Can-Am Crown Sled Dog Races in Maine this weekend. Not one, not two, but three Canadian women became champions. So these races are grueling multi-day marathons, and this year, Catherine Langley from New Brunswick became the first ever woman to win the main event. On International Women's Day, her historic victory is our moment. There's a 30 mile, 100 mile, and a 250 mile. And I ran the 250 mile. I came in this morning and, <laughs> and I came in first. Your win's kind of a big deal, not just a, a dream come true, but uh, you're the first woman to ever win. Yeah, and that's what I'm, <laughs> sorry. That's what I'm very proud of. I'm always one to fight for, you know, that women are just as important in every field as in men, and we're just as competent and we can accomplish the same things and above and beyond. But I won along with two other women, and all Canadian women as well.
Uh, we don't have much rest during these races. I probably slept three hours, three hours and a half this weekend. It's long hours just uh, out in the trail in the darkness. I haven't really eaten a full meal since Saturday. I'm about to change. I didn't expect I could be finishing in first place this morning, and it's, it's like surreal. Ah, congratulations. A little backstory here. Catherine gave that interview from the finish line while waiting for a bowl of soup that she was desperate to eat. So she was very hungry. So thank you, Catherine, for that. And congratulations to everyone. That is The National for March the 8th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.